Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite fields, subfields, theorem, whatever it is, doesn't really matter. Welcome back anyway. Um, today I would like to talk about a field of mathematics which originates, as far as I can tell, uh, before 19, well, actually quite a bit before, like let's say in the 1850s, and Hilbert was one of the main contributors to the theory, and it's called invariant theory. If you don't know what invariant is, it's kind of a weird name that I think is only really present in mathematics. It essentially means fixed, like fixed points of a system. Yeah. If you ever see a storm somewhere, the eye of the storm is a fixed point of the storm, if you want. And it's the kind of the most important part of the storm. So fixed points in mathematics and in life and whatever, they're always very interesting. And in invariant theory is somewhat the systematic study of fixed points in an algebraic way. So what you really look at is usually group actions on um, algebraic varieties. But that sounds very fancy, so let's just may say nice actions on somewhere and you're looking for fixed points and I give you several examples um, as we go along. It's kind of very nice, different kind of field as a mixture between say algebra and geometry. So invariant theory, kind of classical. And where it somewhat comes from, and this is a, my, my picture here is a bit of a lie, uh, so you should really think of these arrows as more as inspired or is related to. But anyway, um, for today I would like to, or kind of a little bit of a lie as I said, say that they all come from the uh, so-called Erlangen program. Erlangen program, famous, well, famous idea of uh, Felix Klein and many other people. Mm, it's kind of this idea that group actions describe uh, many, many properties. Um, so kind of groups should describe the symmetries of an object and group actions is actually really the most important thing. So kind of symmetries of a space and symmetries lead to a lot of different things. The linear study of symmetries, the representation theory um, and kind of the, the continuous symmetries are Lie groups, Lie algebras, um, but we are today on the other side. So if you have something that acts somewhere, as I said, the eye of the storm, uh, the fixed point of the system might be interesting and kind of invariant theory come, come from this comes from this idea, right? If group actions are everywhere, if you believe that idea, uh, then you should study fixed points of group actions. Makes sense. And kind of invariant theory, if you're an algebraic geometer, you know a lot of invariant theory because it has inspired at least a lot of a lot of algebraic geometry. Not just algebra, not algebraic geometry itself. Algebraic geometry itself came from slightly different questions, as far as I can tell. More from questions of how many conics intersect in blue and whatever some kind of normative geometry type questions around the same time as invariant theory itself. But anyway, I think for today this picture is kind of fine. So we have this idea of group actions are everywhere. The Erlangen program. And if you believe that fixed points should be important, fixed points invariant. So let's maybe study uh, invariant theory. And that's what people did. And kind of the, the main key example, there's one key example I would like to make, and this is my main theorem, is related to the symmetric group. So symmetric group, uh, automorphisms of a set, I usually just like to draw them as diagrams. So, so here, one goes to spot two, two goes to spot three, three goes to spot one. Anyway, the so symmetric group acts on a simplex, uh, and the easiest example of a simplex is a triangle, and it acts on a triangle by, well, let's, let's just do it in, in the way I like to do it. I just uh, kind of break the symmetry of the triangle a little bit by coloring the corners, well, whatever, green, red, and blue, and the symmetric group corresponds to putting green to the second spot, which was for before red, putting red to the final spot, which was before blue, and putting blue to the first spot, which is green. So blue should come go where green is, for example, green should go where red is, and red should go where blue was. And it's an action of the somatic group on um, the triangle in this case. Yeah? So hopefully it makes some sense. Uh, so you could swap two and three. It's like fixing green because green in my notation is one. And not just that the group, this is a nice action, but also SN determines uh, the symmetries of the, of the simplex of the triangle in this case. Again, the Erlangen program is like this idea of 
yeah, the summer trees should be described by a group. And here we can see that like, like in action, the summer trees of the triangle, it has um, the following type of summer trees. You can rotate the triangle, well, by, what is it, 120 degrees, I guess. Or you can reflect the triangle, maybe a better color like this, like this. And here is one of the reflection actions, actually. Um, and this generates a group. Turns out that the group in this case is isomorphic to the somatic group. And in general, that's true for any simplex. So the next dimensional simplex would be the tetrahedron, the higher version of a triangle. And then there's a four-dimensional tetrahedron and a five-dimensional tetrahedron and whatever. And this is like the type of uh, kind of question that comes out of the Erlang program and the symmetries of an object, symmetric group acting on an easy space. And the invariant theory question then should be, what about the fixed points, right? The invariants, the, the fixed points. Um, it could also be called fixed point theory, I guess, but it classically is called invariant theory. Yeah, so what are the fixed points of this action? And in this case, there are no fixed points at all. That's a bit boring, um, but there's a way to create fixed points. And usually algebra is like to work on some linear fields, they like a vector space. And if you go to a vector space, you can actually generate a fixed point. So if you are allowed to take sums of those guys, then kind of the sum of uh, uh, the X, well, if you think of X1 as like being green, X2 as being whatever, blue and X3 as being red, then the sum of all of them is clearly invariant under permuting them around. Yeah. So here, this guy, uh, X1, plus x2 plus x3, x green plus x red plus x blue. And people nowadays would say that these are the degree one invariants because, well, give, a, give every uh, every symbol here, every symbol in this polynomial setting, uh, every variable degree one, then this is the degree one, well, invariant. And then what people did, people realized it, is that you can actually uh, nicely extend this action to the whole polynomial ring, and you get kind of the other type of invariance. Um, the, well, let's say the degree two invariant, if you just look at this, this my second example here, uh, these are called, by the way, the E's are called the elementary symmetric polynomials, and they are easily defined by, by this formula. Um, so yeah, we can, you can essentially guess the definition from those examples. And there's, there's another invariant of degree three. And this is like what the invariant theory then likes to study. So what are the invariant uh, polynomials in this case under the action of the somatic group on the polynomial ring, which really just permutes the variables, right? I could call the variables x green, x whatever, blue and x red. And my little picture from here, permuting the corners, the colored corners of the triangle. Uh, you could think of this as because permuting the variables in this set classical uh, invariant theory question, what are the fixed points under this action? Right? And it turns out that the answer is ridiculously nice uh, because so the fixed points are usually denoted by whatever kind of space you act on and then you put it in a superscript, uh, the group act, the, the group acting group, yeah, the invariants. And it turns out that these are really nice things that everyone likes and everyone has studied like before, way before invariant theory. Maybe not everyone. People have studied before invariant theory. I'm pretty. I'm pretty convinced that most people don't know what invariants, uh, symmetric polynomials are. But it doesn't matter. I hope you do. Um, like those guys here. Yeah. So whatever polynomials that are invariant under the action of swapping uh, variables. Turns out that this story kind of goes further. It's kind of one of my favorites. Uh, symmetric polynomials are spent by the elementary symmetric ones. So those guys here. And they are actually algebraically independent. Uh -huh. So that's very interesting. In other words, the invariance of S x1 up to Sn, xn under the action, is again a polynomial ring just in the elementary symmetric polynomials. So the invariance under an action of a polynomial ring is a polynomial ring. And to me, this always looks like, like this little picture, because of course now I have a polynomial ring, so I could permute now the elementary symmetric polynomials and take the fixed points under that action, and I would get another polynomial ring. 
kind of fun. Um, it looks like you're doing, getting something smaller, right? you're taking fixed points on an action, but you're actually still at the same size. Kind of one of these uh, funny, funny, uh, strange behaviors under of, of infinite dimensional spaces because uh, polynomials are, of course, infinite dimension. An invariant theory, essentially, is just answering similar type of questions where you have uh, more sophisticated actions, maybe geometrically more appropriate is the following example. So the determinant is the invariant or is, is invariant under the action of SLN. So let's say SL2, just two by two matrices, uh, let's say N equals two. Um, SL2, two by two matrices, uh, this is a C, oh God, with determinant one. Uh, so uh, AB minus CD equals one. Very good. And they act on matrices by just, well, by just multiplying them a times m, let's say from the left. So a is my element in SL2 in this case, or SLN, doesn't matter. And you again can wonder what are the invariants under that action? There's a group acting on a space. And it turns out that the invariant in this case uh, are just spent, it's again a polynomial ring, by the way, and it's spent by the determinant. And it's kind of similar type of examples were discovered in the 1980s, 1850s, so 80, oh, no, wait, 1850, 1850s, roughly-ish, and yeah, people were wondering in what, in what sense is this general, can we build a theory, and there you go, invariant theory uh, was born. This is essentially where it comes from. Kind of similar type of questions. So the symmetric polynomial example, I like that a lot, right? The doll and the doll and the doll. Um, but this one is probably more classical uh, type of a question in variant theory likes to answer. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I will talk to see you next time.